All right, guys, we are live in our studio here on this Tuesday, July 10th. Jackie's joining me. Hey, Jack. Hi. Intro Jackie to chat about some of the morning news, and then you might have to run. I'm not quite sure what you're working yeah. on today. But we'll we're see. so glad to have you, and thanks for waiting, guys, as we put all this up. We're going to hit you with the updates from our D.C. mayor and um, other officials here in D.C. about the All-Star Game. Super excited. One week from today, everybody descends on D.C. for the official MLB All-Star Game that's going to be happening at Nationals Park next Tuesday. So super excited for that. We're going to be getting some updates. Here's a live look at that bump shot right there. We're going to have those. They're going to be speaking about it right in front of the park. There they are at Nats Park, so that's super exciting. Awesome. But for now, to coming back into the newsroom, just a couple of top stories from this morning that we've been chatting about. Maybe you guys have been reading into this or knowing, but the biggest story this morning, the, um, the boys, the soccer team in the Thai, the cave in Thailand have all been rescued. Thank goodness. Thank God. Their coach, all the Navy SEALs that went down to get them. The story is quite crazy. We were talking about this this morning. Isn't this insane? It's the information trickling out. Yeah, it's a crazy story. I feel like it started off very broken, mm. and not a lot of people knew what was going on. I had no idea. It mm -hmm. was 
very strange. And just the way that they got lost, I think, was a little confusing. Yeah, and it's an interesting because we've been, you know, not privy to all the details all the time, but some news outlets have had these intricate maps laid out to kind of show the way that these kids were rescued and how everybody, you know, how they were able to go in and how Navy SEALs, a couple of American Navy SEALs went over to assist in this. Yeah. But if you guys caught that, um, really, it's a it's a positive update and mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good story. So we're going to play you that right now just to give you sort of the, the latest update on uh, what happened this morning. In a flooded cave more than two miles underground. Now, 12 boys and their soccer coach have been brought to the surface. Tide Navy SEALs guiding them out through dark, narrow passageways. Experts are applauding the SEALs for what appears to be a well-executed rescue plan. The whole time they were in there, they were staging tanks all the way through that. Then they were relighting it, and then they were re going over it again, and then again, and again, um, every single right. time. And it, and it just goes to show how fast and how um, productive they were. Today's extraction is the culmination of three days of intense, dangerous deep cave diving, bringing the boys out one at a time, each guided by two SEALs. Thai authorities are praising the work of the military, first responders, and foreign dive teams but also focusing on how to make sure an accident like this doesn't happen again. We need to have better security at this cave. We need to find a secure method for visitors to go in and out. People should not be allowed to enter during the monsoon season. The five extracted today are now recovering in a local hospital, along with the eight others extracted Sunday and Monday. All are said to be doing well. Meanwhile, friends and family are breathing a sigh of relief and are looking forward to seeing the boys again soon. I feel happy that my friends have left the cave. We're all strong. I am happy. I am happy for them. I want to say thanks. It's like winning the lottery. President Trump also tweeting his congratulations to the Thai Navy SEALs, writing, quote, such a beautiful moment. In Shanghai, Thailand, Jeff Paul, Fox News. Really just such an incredible story there out of Thailand. And that was the latest update. They broke that uh, piece of news this morning around 7 a.m. Eastern time is when we started to get in that information. And then we were able to uh, break that on our morning air this morning. Um, so really incredible. Those boys are now recovering uh, in the hospital. And we'll, we'll wait to kind of hear more updates on that situation. But over now to locally, guys, the All-Star Game. We're talking about this for weeks now. It's happening in one week. Super exciting. It's the 89th annual um, all-Star Game, and it's right here in Washington. They're setting up right now at Nats Park to speak on that. It it's entails a whole weekend of festival activities and festivities throughout the weekend and into next week. Home Run Derby on Monday and the game on Tuesday, and they're going to be updating us uh, with what to expect, and um, we're going to hear from the officials, on the Vice President of Operations from the Nationals, our own mayor and police chief on this. So that's coming up next. We're going to throw you over there listen in to what they have to say and then we'll be back in the newsroom with more uh, breaking news for you guys anything breaking live events all the top stories of the day we're going to have it for you here in our newsroom on this tuesday happy to be back we were down yesterday i uh, came back from a trip and now i'm back and ready to go in the newsroom for you guys so um let us know your comments let us know what you think where you're watching from and uh, if anything is relatable for you let's chat about it we're going to go over to nationals park where they're about to get started Can I crouch down? Can I crouch down? Um, a gimbal I'm going to give you a try. A gimbal that you might like. Yeah. 
because you put the um, iPhone on it and you've got an electronic joystick that you can move and tilt. Oh, it's awesome. I love it. I think it was 170 bucks. I bought it and I really love it. I, you can borrow it. You can borrow it because I barely use it. I thought I would use it a lot more, but I think it would be great for you. Got, yeah, just tiny learning curve. Tiny, it's tiny cool. learning curve. Oh, yeah, it's citywide. Is it citywide? Citywide, yep. DC Fires Radio. So it's used. Oh, yeah. So this is for temperature. It goes in the fire and it won't burn. Won't. Yeah. Yep. Both the battery and the casing. Yeah, it's about, I think it's about 8,000. Yeah. Huh? Ma'am?
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Muriel Bowser. I am the mayor of Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to Nationals Park here in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, and home to this year's MLB All-Star Game. I am pleased to be joined by members of my team um, to provide an update to D.C. residents and visitors and all attendees of the All-Star Game about how our city is preparing preparing uh, for a wonderful time over the next uh, several days. Uh, let me uh, announce to a few people who you will hear from as well. Uh, the Chief of Police of the Metropolitan Police Department, Peter Newsham, the Director of the D.C. Department of Transportation, Jeff Marudian. Uh, we're also joined by Frank Gambino, who is Senior Vice President of Operations for our team, the Washington Nationals, and Marla Miller, who is Senior Vice President of Special Events for Major League Baseball. Let's give them all a hand. I, I should remind everybody uh, that we have had a very big week in sports uh, in Washington, D.C., and, and indeed a, a great month. Uh, we just yesterday cut the ribbon on the fantastic new Audi field, which is home uh, to our soccer team. Uh, we want to congratulate all of the members of the D.C. United uh, as we get ready for their first game at Audi Field this Saturday. Uh, we were also, of course, very proud to celebrate uh, our hockey team uh, in celebrating the Caps bringing home the Stanley Cup to Washington, D.C. And now this week, we are preparing for the 89th MLB R-Star game. Our goal is, of course, with all big events, uh, which were old-handed big events, uh, to make sure that we ensure the safety of all residents and visitors, to make sure that all activities that take place are, take place as planned and everybody can move in and around the city uh, at the same time. As the nation's capital, we are used to supporting uh, large events like this one. Uh, we do it uh, whether we're welcoming the Pope or having the inauguration of a president or inviting a million women to our city. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody enjoys themselves, exercises their rights, uh, and gets home safely. Uh, we have set up a place for you to find any and all information related to the city's pre preparations. And you may go to sportscapital.dc.gov, sportscapital.dc.gov. You may also text DC Sports to 888 dash 777 to receive updates and alerts. So I want to now invite our chief of police to come up, followed by our director of transportation, who will talk uh, more about closures related uh, to all star festivities. Chief. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Bowser. Uh, I also want to thank Major League Baseball and our hometown Washington Nationals. Uh, for hosting this year's All-Star Week. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank all of our partners who have worked so hard with us over the past several months to ensure that we have a plan to ensure we have a safe and successful 89th Major League Baseball All-Star Week. I can't think of a better city to host one of baseball's most treasured games uh, than our city, Washington, D.C. Uh, coming off of our first Stanley Cup uh, in Capitals franchise history, Washington, D.C. has proven that we can execute a safe, fun, high-profile sporting event uh, for a national audience. I do not anticipate anything different here. At this time, there are no credible threats to the nation's capital during All-Star Week, uh, where events will begin on Friday, and they'll culminate uh, with the Home Run Derby and the All-Star Game on July 16th and 17th. We hope to see families from across our region atten attending any one of the activities as there will be something to do for people of all ages. We are urging residents and visitors alike to plan ahead, be patient, anticipate longer travel times, and as always, be courteous to one another and to your law enforcement officers. The area around the baseball stadium will obviously be impacted, but everyone should also be aware that there are a number of road closures in place on separate days and various locations across the district. As the mayor has already mentioned, please visit sportscapital.dc.gov for specifics. 
Uh, we want you to visit that site before you travel uh, so you have a plan in place. Uh, you, this uh, site will include road closures, transit options, and a full schedule of the events during All-Star Week. Uh, as a reminder, carrying open containers of alcohol in the District of Columbia is prohibited. MPD will have both uniformed and non-uniformed officers working all of the events. So just because you don't see an officer doesn't mean an officer isn't present. While we encourage everyone to enjoy any or all of the Major League Baseball events, we would like to remind everyone to use safety precautions, common sense, and good judgment. If you are going to purchase tickets for any of the events, please do so from a trusted source. Uh, and just as you hear from law enforcement all the time, if you see something suspicious, please tell a law enforcement officer, or in other words, if you see something, say something. I'm now going to invite Jeff uh, Maruti and our director of the Department of Transportation uh, to the stand to talk about uh, transportation around the city during All-Star Week. Yeah. Thank you, Chief Newsham. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Uh, our team at DDOT has been mobilizing uh, across our agency uh, to support all of the events of the next week uh, and working very hard to ensure coordination uh, with all of the agencies that are involved, our colleagues at the Metropolitan Police Department, the Department of Four Hire Vehicles, WMATA, our uh, colleagues in Maryland and Virginia's Department of Transportation and their law enforcement agencies. We are preparing for large crowds, uh, for road closures, and for delays, uh, as the chief mentioned. Uh, as the mayor said and as the chief reiterated, uh, if you are planning to visit the district, uh, we are excited to have you here and we encourage you to please utilize public transportation. There are a number of options. Uh, all of them uh, are on the website, as has been, uh, as has been said, sportscapital.dc.gov. Uh, I would also uh, encourage everybody to sign up for text alerts uh, by texting DC Sports to 888-777. Uh, to assist motorists, uh, we have identified alternate routes, detours. Uh, we also have variable message boards posted throughout the district. Uh, if you must drive, as the chief said, please plan ahead uh, and expect delays. Uh, the district employs some of the best traffic control officers anywhere, and they will be out in force uh, to ensure the safety of the traveling public, uh, and also to assist with our transportation network uh, companies, Lyft, Uber, and Via. Uh, we will be setting up designated areas uh, for, for those companies to operate and for the public to access them. So again, uh, we'll also have uh, capital bike share uh, and bike corrals throughout the area uh, for, for those uh, members of the public who would like to, uh, to use uh, bicycles. The best place to find all information about our closures, about transportation options, uh, is to visit the website, sportscapital.dc.gov, or to sign up for text alerts, 888-777, uh, text DC Sports. Uh, thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite up Marla Miller, who is the Senior Vice President for Special Events at Major League Baseball. Thank you. Move this down a little. Everybody's very tall here in DC. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor Bowser, Chief and Director Marudian. Um, on behalf of Commissioner Robert Manfred, the Washington Nationals, and Major League Baseball, uh, we are excited and thrilled to be hosting the 89th All-Star Game here in Nationals Park, as well as a robust schedule of events in and around the nation's capital. Uh, there is a full week schedule to various youth, community, and cultural events that will uh, create a lasting legacy for local projects that benefit as a part of Major League Baseball's All-Star Legacy Initiative. Starting this afternoon, MLB and the Nationals will launch a series of community projects that will leave a legacy for Greater Washington and its citizens long after the last play of the All-Star Game. MLB is dedicating $5 million to this effort with a significant portion going to projects in this area. Children, families, and active service members will play a crucial role in what everyone will remember about the greatest All-Star Week held in Washington, D.C. All-Star Week is fun for everyone, so we hope that fans will have a chance to have some type of an All-Star experience. Starting on Friday, July 13th, Geico All-Star Fan Fest opens at the Convention Center through Tuesday, July 17th. FanFest is the world's largest baseball theme park with over 50 baseball attractions, including the world's largest baseball, legends autograph signings, pitching and caging machines, 
and new attractions that include an in-game virtual reality experience, a field of dreams, the MLB performance attraction, and many others. Uh, tickets, if you're interested, are available at allstargame.com. Uh, where we are today will be the center of all-star activity and excitement with the major events happening here at the ballpark. Uh, beginning on Friday, July 13th, with the inaugural Armed Services Classic Game presented by T-Mobile, followed by All-Star Sunday, which, which features both the Sirius XM Futures game and the Legends and Celebrity Softball game, Monday's T-Mobile Home Run Derby, and then, of course, the 89th All-Star Game presented by MasterCard on Tuesday, July 17th. All-Star events here by Yards Park includes Playball Park. Playball Park is a free interactive space where kids and families can enjoy a variety of baseball and softball activities. Playball Park will open on Friday at 10 a.m. and this too will be open through Tuesday, the day of the All-Star Game. Playball Park will also host and finish our All-Star Color Run presented by Nike at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning, July 14th. Anyone who wants more information on All-Star events, timings, and tickets can visit allstargame.com. Additional public events hosted around the ballpark include the Capitol Riverfront All-Star Summer River Fest presented by Coca-Cola. That includes outdoor movies, viewing parties, music and food, and the Wharf will also be hosting indoor and outdoor events during All-Star Week as well. So, after saying all those different events, in closing, Major League Baseball wants to acknowledge and thank Mayor Bowser and many, many of the city agencies that have been involved the last year in the planning process, and we look forward to the fans having an easy and safe access to this once-in-a-lifetime all-star experience here in D.C., and thank you all very much. Okay, we can take a few questions. Yes, ma'am, please identify yourself. Ann Cutler with Fox 5 News. Uh -huh. This is Jess. Actually, will there be any single tracking? Will we be charging for parking at the metro station over the weekend? Um, let me actually invite uh, General Manager Wiedefeld to talk about metro operations. Sure thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, no, we've um, suspended all major um, maintenance work for the whole weekend, so there's no issues there. On just our normal, what we normally do on uh, Saturdays and Sundays, so it's nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Dan Thompson, DCW 50. Uh, Chief, uh, I know you said there are no known threats right now, but can you take us through some of the logistical precautions standpoint, how this is going to be different from, let's say, you know, a high profile uh, playoff game? Uh, how it would be different from a high-profile playoff game? Well, you know, we're going to have people coming from all across the country to see the best players uh, in baseball in the world, uh, including, I believe, three nationals, uh, Bryce Harper, uh, Doolittle, and Scherzer. Um, so the, the only real difference is I think we'll have more visitors for, for this occasion than we might have for, for an all-star game. I think for, I mean, for a, a playoff game, I think for a playoff game, it would be largely uh, people from the city. Uh, but we don't, we, don't, we don't have any credible threats right now. Uh, Washington, D.C. is one of the cities that's best in the country at planning, preparing, and executing these types of large uh, events. We saw what happened just a few weeks ago uh, with the Capitals when they won the World Championship. So I think we're going to have, I think it's going to be a fun time. Yes, ma'am. Sure, I'm going to ask uh, Director Mavrudian to come to address that question. But I should also add, and I think you heard from Marla's comments, uh, that Major League Baseball has been working with us. I think we were uh, selected for the game back in 2014, uh, and since then have been involved in a lot of planning efforts with Major League Baseball, including our teams from HCMA and my office going down to the 
the last All-Star game to see uh, how uh, how it operated and to make sure that not only did we operate as good as the last one, but even better. Uh, and so our teams have been coordinating uh, very frequently uh, to make sure we are prepared for that. So I'm going to ask Jeff to come up to talk about um, construction and how it, construction is impacting everything. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think the mayor really said it best. We've been preparing and coordinating very closely uh, with the entire community, uh, the, the local residential community, the business community, uh, the development community, uh, to minimize uh, the impacts uh, with regard to traffic. The, uh, the closures have been very carefully planned and detailed uh, so that all the information that we've got on our website is, uh, is very clear as to when those closures are in effect, uh, the, uh, the specific timing, uh, and construction is a part of that. Uh, uh, so uh, we just ask folks to take note of all of those things. We've done our best to, to minimize uh, all of those impacts while allowing uh, all the construction work uh, that you noted to, to continue to the greatest extent possible. And some of the activity you see is Major League Baseball loading in. Um, they're building a small little city uh, for the next week around Nationals Park. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, we're pretty beautiful already. Thank you. <laughs> Landscaping? Um, uh, we are, <laughs> I, I think that we're very proud of how we present to the world. Um, and I think you can see even in parts of the city, like we were in yesterday at Aud Audi Field that had been industrial, um, but now have different uses are, are showing up very nicely. Uh, we're in an area of the city where a lot of the events happen uh, that's already served by a bid. Uh, that they have even extra uh, clean and safe and beautification efforts and branding efforts, which I know the Capitol Riverfront bid uh, is very proud of. Uh, we're also focused on the activities around the convention center to make sure that people know how to get uh, in and out of the convention center. But we pride ourselves in being clean and safe and beautiful for the 700,000 people that live here each and every day. Uh, and it's just uh, even better when we have more visitors to come to see a game. Yes. I know there was an eligible study that said the economic impact was expected to be about $70 million. Does the cost of what's being spent outweigh that? Can you tell me what the rough estimates might be for transportation, extra staffing, police? The, the city made an early commitment and maybe um, the city administrator, can you join us for the early commitment we made from a city and in the investment? Uh, and the, the short answer, and the city administrator will give you more specifics, is yes. We think the economic benefits of having this number of visitors and attention on the city and hotel rooms filled and people in restaurants um, pay, uh, pay off. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Mayor is absolutely right. I just heard uh, from Gregory McCarthy from the Nationals that uh, hotels are booked solid, um, restaurants are booked solid rather for next week. Hotels are starting to fill up. Um, we expect to spend about $4.4, $4.5 million uh, for all of our costs, most of that for overtime uh, and personnel deployments to support the event uh, against a $70 million return. Uh, this, this really, this economic investment or return is much greater uh, than the resources we'll expend to pr produce this event. Yes, sir. Can we go off topic? Any other questions? Before we do that, I just want to make sure um, I thank again all of uh, so many people have been working hard to get ready for this event. Uh, from, from my administration. You heard some questions about clean and safe. Our DPW workers will be out um, making sure that we maintain uh, the level of service that our residents expect. So thank you, DPW. Uh, DCRA, make sure everything is uh, also healthy and safe. So thank you. I want to thank our Department of Health uh, that ensures that all the vending options that are available uh, meet our standards in addition to making sure that everybody who who is out uh, and enjoying uh, the city in, in the heat and humidity are also doing it in a safe way. I want to thank our Department of Energy and the Environment. We have a very high standard for producing things in a sustainable way, and I want to thank you, DOE. Uh, you heard already from our city administrator, uh, who's coordinating with all of our 
agency directors and our budget to make sure um, that we can uh, make these things happen. Uh, our general manager from the region's metro system, Paul Wiedefeld, is also here and coordinates always with our HCMA. HCMA is here. That is the district's Homeland Security Agency, and we thank you, HCMA, for your help. Um, our real estate and uh, construction arm at DGS, thank you, DGS, for all your help. Deputy City Administrator, thank you for your help. Uh, I also want to acknowledge our 911 call center and fire and emergency service um, that is part of the critical public safety team that will keep all of our visitors safe. You heard already from the police chief uh, and our DDOT director. So this is uh, the DC government team working hand in hand with MLB uh, in our sports capital. Uh, and also to the Washington Nationals, our host today, let's give a hand to the Washington Nationals. Uh, who just played a huge role in attracting Major League Baseball to D.C., showing Major League Baseball that we are a baseball city. Right, Washington? Yes. And again, congratulations to the Nationals players who will represent us. Okay. Um, it looks like seven of the council members who continue to legislation to appeal the referendum on Initiative 77. Is that something you would support? I do not support Initiative 77, so uh, I look forward to seeing the, the council's deliberations in action. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> oh my god ah, so awesome thanks guys for waiting super exciting stuff for dc obviously coming up with the all-star game and i noticed some of you guys commenting on the chat as well it really is a true excitement for dc to be setting up for that obviously the mayor just there talking about how dc is in fact a baseball city and i think a lot of us here agree uh, so so looking forward to that and we're going to bring you any other live updates on that or any live news pertaining to the game. The Home Run Derby is on Monday night. The game is on Tuesday night. I know tickets were going for hundreds and hundreds of dollars a while back. Um, I believe we're going to be doing our special morning show from the area, that park. Our anchors are going to be down there that morning. Um, I don't believe I'll be privy to that, but hopefully I'll get involved some way. So looking forward to that next week for sure. In other uh, more serious news, guys, politics, of course, President Trump uh, announcing his nominee for uh, his pick for SCOTUS, Brett Kavanaugh, who is the um, conservative leaning, would be the th five out of nine conservative leaning uh, justices on the court. And he is from around here, Chevy Chase, Maryland. So local has a local angle there. 
Um, and there's been some fallout from that. A lot of people talking about it, people on the Hill uh, talking about their feelings on it. We have some of those stories and a lot more for some of our top stories from today, July 10th, here in the newsroom. So thanks for hanging out with us today, guys. We're going to be um, jumping around. Uh, President Trump is on his way to the um, NATO conference in Brussels. So he is actually, I believe, on a plane right now. Nothing will really happen domestically with him today, or we won't be bringing in anything like that. But we'll be keeping an eye on that um, and whatever comes in abroad that we can take for you. Um, but let's go to some of those top stories, give you sort of a rundown on that Supreme Court pick and some of the other stories of today. It was not exactly a shock. We knew that he was a front runner, but the reaction has been intense, with critics hoping to derail the nomination. It was loud and at times verging on out of control outside the U.S. Supreme Court. Protesters for and against a nomination that had just been announced. Tonight, it is my honor and privilege to announce that I will nominate Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court. The President Trump had built up anticipation for this moment as Brett Kavanaugh and his family emerged at the White House, the federal appellate court judge promising to faithfully interpret the Constitution. A judge must interpret the Constitution as written, informed by history, and tradition and precedent. The speed of the opposition was something to see. About seven minutes after the announcement, outside the court, protesters hung a printed sign that said, Stop Kavanaugh. About six minutes after that, the Democratic National Committee put out an anti-Kavanaugh video. One group, the Women's March, put out a statement denouncing Kavanaugh, but forgot to replace an XX placeholder with his name. All indications of just how intense the campaigns for and against this nomination will be. I am not going to kid anybody. This is a tough fight, but it is a fight that we can win. As for Kavanaugh, his record as a judge is relatively lengthy, giving the Senate plenty of material to plow through in the weeks ahead. And while he is seen as a conservative, the margins for the White House on this in the Senate are going to be very tight. Very tight, and so is the timeline here. The White House would like to have this all wrapped up by October 1st. In Washington, Doug Luzader, Fox News. With hurricane season underway, island and coastal communities from the Caribbean up the U.S. Atlantic coast are preparing for the latest round of storms. In Puerto Rico, Beryl was downgraded from a hurricane to a tropical storm on Sunday, and now it is just remnants of Beryl, easing fears of another storm hitting an island still recovering from the last major hurricane. It's possible we will get hit hard here, but we have to keep trying to survive no matter what happens. God gives us faith. Beryl is still expected to bring winds and rains across the island, anywhere between two and three inches of rain, but nothing like Hurricane Maria. That Category 4 storm hitting the island in September of 2017, responsible for thousands of deaths and causing more than $100 billion in damage. And across the Caribbean, on islands like Dominica, Guadeloupe, and St. Martin, officials are warning locals and tourists alike to take caution. Seas are deteriorating. Swells of up to 10 feet are expected. Small craft operators and sea bathers should be vigilant. Off the Atlantic coast, Tropical Storm Chris is developing off the Carolinas. While it's not expected to make landfall in the U.S., Chris is expected to bring dangerous surfs and riptides along the way. And the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as Puerto Rico, officially still under a tropical storm watch, but Good news for everybody in Puerto Rico. The remnants of Beryl are officially now just a tropical wave. In San Juan, Puerto Rico, Phil Keating, Fox News.
A group of volunteers from New Mexico are trying to help separated illegal immigrant families have a more comfortable experience, even in the midst of an intense debate over their future. Sarah Saucedo drove from Albuquerque to El Paso to drop off donated goods such as children's clothes, diapers, hygiene items, and shoes at a home for those seeking asylum. My grandma always used to say that it only took one voice singing in the dark, and I really feel that if you see an injustice and you have have the time and the power and the availability, you should do something about it. Saucedo teamed up with Dr. Genevieve Garcia de Mueller, who's been involved with immigration policy work to collect all the items over two weeks ago. I'm not comfortable with how divisive you know, the, the idea of, you know, not housing children in detention centers has become. I, I don't think that it needs to be a, you know, a political issue. I think it needs to be a humanitarian issue. Jorge Gomez lives near the border and works for Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center and helped the volunteers on Monday. It's little things that we can do. It's, that's why I really appreciate the work that Jen, you know, Dr. Garcia is doing. And I'm just happy to be here to help with that. Las Americas also hopes to provide resources like translators and even psychologists for families who may be facing some emotional trauma or language barriers. In El Paso, Texas, Charlie Lapastora, Fox News. between you smelling it when you walk down the street. Now you need to watch what the dog is picking up. The American Veterinary Medical Association says over the past six years, calls to the poison hotline about pets accidentally ingesting marijuana has skyrocketed 448%. The vets at the animal hospital weren't surprised. They initially, you know, kind of immediately half diagnosed it and said we need to run some blood work to confirm it. And they said the only thing we could do was give him an injection to, you know, settle his stomach. He just needs to to let it run his system. James Higgins was walking his dog, Gordon, last month through Carl Schurz Park, one of the city's most dog friendly. When they got home, things just weren't right. He missed like three or four steps and fell halfway down the flight of stairs. And then when he was in the, in the apartment, he was standing up and he kept on falling over. So we thought he had hurt his hip and maybe dislocated it or something. So that's why we brought him down to the animal hospital. The last thing we were expecting is that he was as high as a kite. Two-year-old Gordon had most likely scarfed down weed that was discarded on the ground, leading to a scary afternoon. At lower doses, if they're just kind of acting kind of strange or, you know, maybe having some trouble walking or dribbling urine, um, typically we may give them a little bit of fluids um, or some or a lipid infusion, um, which can help them feel better faster. But typically, you know, they'll be fine at lower doses. At higher doses, they can need pretty intense critical medical care. Canines have more cannabinoid receptors in their brain, which means the physiological effect of weed is much more powerful in dogs than in humans, along with disoriented behavior and dribbling urine, dogs can also see their heart rate and body temperature drop. The other thing that is concerning is that a lot of times um, marijuana edibles are mixed with chocolate, um, which chocolate is also toxic to dogs, um, and that can have its own problems. Dogs are more likely to ingest marijuana, but cats can also be affected. And while we're on the subject of pot and pets, it's also important to remember that marijuana smoke can also lead to your furry friend getting a contact buzz. On the Upper East Side, Erica Wachter, Fox 5 News. I'm Chad Pergram with the Fox News Congressional Capsule. Congress returns to Washington after a week and a half recess for July 4th. Senators will soon learn who President Trump taps to succeed retiring Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. Expect a big fight over the confirmation process. The GOP will target at least three Democratic senators who face re-election this fall in states carried by President Trump. Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota, Joe Donnelly of Indiana, and Joe Manchin of West Virginia. All three voted last year to confirm Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. But Republicans are leery of losing two of their own in the Supreme Court battle, Maine Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. With the absence of GOP Arizona Senator John McCain, the Senate math is effectively 50 Republicans and 49 senators who caucus with the Democrats. That's not a lot of wiggle room on either side to confirm the next justice. And despite making lots of noise about blocking a nominee, Senate Democrats can't do much. The Senate does much of its work via precedent. To understand the importance of precedent in the Senate, consider the size of the Senate rule book compared to the size of the book of Senate precedent. Last year, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell established a new precedent in the Senate for the confirmation of Supreme Court nominees. 
He changed the filibuster rule, lowering the threshold to end a filibuster from 60 votes to just a simple majority. With the Congressional Capsule, I'm Chad Pergram, Fox News. Wounded warrior, prisoner of war, disabled veteran, and an inspiration to serve. Jennifer Minus is talking about her hero, Margaret Corbin, one of the first women to fight in the American Revolution. Margaret Corbin's life and actions are not just a story. They are not just folklore. She was a real woman who lived, fought, and was recognized by name in congressional acts and War Department correspondence up to 1790. Corbin's heroic story started on November 16, 1776, when she took over her husband's cannon after he was killed during the Battle of Fort Washington in Upper Manhattan. From across the Hudson River, General George Washington watched as some 3,000 Americans battled 9,000 British and Hessian troops. It was a devastating loss for the Americans. Many were wounded, including Corbin, who was hit by grape shot in her shoulder and breast, leaving her disabled for the rest of her life. On July 6, 1779, Corbin, nicknamed Captain Molly, was awarded a lifelong Army pension from the Continental Congress. Making her the first woman veteran of the United States. Corbin died in 1800 and was buried in an unmarked grave. In 1926, the Daughters of the American Revolution pinpointed what the group believed was Corbin's grave, a few miles south of West Point. The disinterred remains were taken to West Point and buried underneath a monument depicting Corbin. But in 2016, a shocking discovery was made when a gravesite disturbance led to an archaeological study of those remains. A forensic exam proved it was not Corbin, but rather an unidentified man from the 19th century. Now, a hunt is on to find this American hero. Margaret Corbin is a veteran of the United States. She deserves to have the burial that she earned with her military service in the Battle of Fort Washington. Most would agree, especially Corbin's descendants. I brought my copy of Margaret Corbin, the story of Margaret Corbin. This is a trove of details. Oh Jonathan Corbin has spent his entire life tracing his 31 ancestors who fought in the American Revolution. My father was the one who told us about Molly Corbin and uh, would read the story to us as he liked to do. I asked my teacher, how come Molly Corbin's not in this textbook where she should be? Because she was a real hero and uh, she didn't know the answer. And I hope that um, that, that uh, changes because we need to give fuller recognition to what women have done. Corbin's monument was erected at West Point some 50 years before the first female cadets. For decades, she has served as a model of unflinching bravery and sacrifice for women in the U.S. military. And for Minus, a mother and a former West Point instructor, Corbin is a source of inspiration. Sometimes some mornings were not that great uh, with two toddler children um, and uh, very difficult and worried about them, but thinking also about what I needed to do the rest of that day in order to lead and inspire cadets. And I would come out that door right there <laughs> and I would see Margaret Corbin's monument. And I would think if she could do what she did after watching her husband die in front of her, I could do whatever I needed to do that day with no problem. Really such an interesting package there that was uh, narrated by Brett Bayer of Fox News Network. Um, and I love those packages on uh, some of those uh, war veterans and those stories. So just another good feel good kind of featurey story to get you guys through um, your Tuesday. Meanwhile, we're talking about the SCOTUS pick, President Trump and his pick. Last night, there were a ton of rallies, uh, the main one being outside the Supreme Court. And some of you guys are commenting right now on the chat about this. I'm going to show you a little piece of that. Um, it went on for quite a while, and there is some pretty extensive video of it, but if you didn't catch it, I do want to play some of that out for you um, so that you can kind of be in the know of what they were talking about outside the Supreme Court with signs uh, rallying um, to talk about um, the Supreme Court pick. So we're going to play some of that out for you in just a second. Um, yeah, that's coming up next.
Vice President, reckless attacks on all of our communities. Tonight, tonight, HRC calls on the United States Senate to fulfill their constitutional duty and reject this extreme nominee. And as this crowd is making very clear tonight, we are going to fight tooth and nail against this nomination confirmation. But our fight cannot stop here. The stark reality is this may not be Donald Trump's last nomination to the Supreme Court. And that's exactly why we need to vote this November like our rights depend on it, because they do. We need every single person who cares about fairness and who cares about equality to organize, to register your friends to vote, and to turn out at the polls. Make no mistake about it. The midterm elections just became the most important election of our lifetimes. And together, we can pull the emergency brake on the Trump-Pence administration in November, and we can ensure that the words behind me on the top of this grand building, equal justice under law, remain true for every single person in every single corner of this country. Thank you very much.
So guys, obviously it got quite raucous on both sides yesterday. That was last night outside of the Supreme Court. On the steps of the Supreme Court, you'd hear people yelling, abortion is murder. And then you hear Bernie Sanders speak his piece and some other activists as well and politicians 
Uh, they are demonstrating outside of the Supreme Court after President Trump announced his pick for SCOTUS. The new um, judge, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, was chosen, and he'll have to go through, obviously, a series of the uh, nomination hearings and all that. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. That was quite um, boisterous in, in both sides of it. You hear people yelling on both sides and kind of hard to hear some of the people even who are mic'd up. So you could tell it was quite the protest, obviously. But just a little taste of that in case you missed it. That was the rally on the steps. It went on for about an hour and a half. Lots of um, people coming up and talking about their their thoughts on it uh, as this nominee for high court now goes into the, all those proceedings um, to officially become the next Supreme Court justice. So we'll take you away from that as that is, of course, last night's uh, video. But uh, go over to some of the other top stories of the day that we've been tracking. Um, some interesting ones here, too, on um, health and um, some other cool animal stories as well. So we need a little featurey kind of news day. Here are some of our other top stories from today, July 10th. Prescription pills disguised as health supplements. A packet of powder stuffed in a teddy bear. Liquid date rape labeled as bio oil. This is just some of what U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents intercept in U.S. Postal Service packages shipped from overseas. Nationwide federal agents scan 1.7 million international packages every day. Packages containing hidden pills, liquids, or powder are tested using a state-of-the-art machine called the Gemini, capable of rapidly identifying 22,000 substances. And I'm going to activate the, the laser. And within a few seconds, it's going to uh, take its reading. So in this case, it's uh, fentanyl hydrochloride. And so that would be a, a Schedule One narcotic that, that we would seize. Illegal packages are turned over to police, but it can be very difficult to track the senders. Today, Custom and Border agents say fentanyl is the most frequently seized opioid. U.S. Customs and Border Patrol says it seized 1,476 pounds of fentanyl last year, skyrocketing from just two pounds seized in 2013. The painkiller is so lethal a few grains can kill a person. The Center for Disease Control estimates in 2016 fentanyl killed 20,000 people in the U.S. So we're certainly on the front lines of it here. The U.S. House recently passed an ambitious package to combat the drug epidemic blamed for 42,000 deaths in 2016. The package helps direct health institutes to develop non-addictive painkillers and gives Border Patrol and the Postal Service a greater ability to crack down on criminals mailing drugs to America. That comprehensive drug bill passed the House overwhelmingly and is receiving wide support from both parties. It will now go to the Senate for consideration. In Chicago, Matt Finn, Fox News. When you walk into a restaurant like Passion Fish, you look at the menu and you order your crab cake. Well, that's when the cooks here, they get right to work preparing your meal. Usually, you probably don't even give it a second thought, but this year, nearly half of the suppliers on the eastern shore when it comes to crab meat, they're not going to be able to find enough workers. That means restaurants might eventually feel that shortage. The labor shortage comes after a decision by the Trump administration to do away with the first-come, first-served system for issuing H-2B work visas. Due to overwhelming demand, they've now implemented a visa lottery system. This is for companies hoping to employ temporary workers from Mexico. According to the Chesapeake Bay Seafood Industries Association, three of Maryland's largest crab meat suppliers were unable to secure any visas. We're talking about 200 foreign employees, that's 40% of the workforce, gone. The association says each of those workers typically generates two and a half jobs for American workers, but not this year. The chain reaction is being called an economic disaster. Governor Larry Hogan is now speaking out, and the executive chef at Passion Fish says they are trying to prepare for skyrocketing prices. He says he's already seeing a pound of crab meat that typically sells for around $26 retail go for around $35. For the industry to be bracing us for these kind of prices is never really a good sign. The demand is there. Hopefully we, we can get somebody that can help us get the meat. Worst case scenario, there's be nobody buys Maryland crab. I mean, so I don't even want to think about it, to be honest. It's a serious problem. I mean, the, the crab industry is going to be really hurt if we can't get these uh, special visas in. People come in every year. It's the only way that industry survives. If we've been uh, 
working to try to convince the federal government that we've got to reinstate the program. Now, Governor Larry Hogan says they haven't heard back from lawmakers yet as to how the issue is going to be resolved. And the association says that they're hopeful more workers will be allowed to enter into the U.S. for this year's crab season. But as of right now, the future still remains unseen. For now in Bethesda, Melissa Howell, Fox 5 Local News. Hello, I'm calling from the Health Insurance Enrollment Hi, Center. This is Todd with I'm the calling because Department. health insurance companies are calling the calls. Three or four calls a day. Seem never ending. At least like five times a week. And they're <laughs> very annoying. A waste of breath. Some of them will be like, hey, something's wrong with your computer. We encounter a serious issue coming out of your computer. It's kind of a waste of time. Nobody likes those dreaded robocalls. It gets pretty annoying because it's not like it's really important to talk to. Believe it or not, there were roughly 30 billion robocalls placed last year. Do the math. That's a thousand calls every second. Many of them looking like legitimate numbers sharing your same area code. Last month, we wasted more than 50,000 hours of spammers time. The RoboKiller app blocks those calls and goes a step further using recorded bots to annoy the annoyers. Oh, how the tables have turned. And we think that's really important because if we can steal their time, uh, it's time that they can't use to scam anybody. I mean, they're taking time, they're taking money, they're taking identities from people every day. And we think people should be able to get back at them for that. RoboKiller costs $250 a month and it's available on iPhone or Android. If that's not for you, there's still a low-tech way to deal with these calls. If you don't recognize the number, don't answer it. Wait for it to go to your answering machine and check it from there. And always be skeptical. Oh, oh boy. There we go. <laughs> For 96 years, go. Francis Turner oh. has overcome every obstacle before him. Sustaining a severe head and knee injury in World War II, facing near homelessness, and raising three children with Down syndrome, all who have since passed away. I'm the last of my clan, so to speak. Yep. And now you're helping dozens of other kids. Yes, because I believe it's the thing to do and we should help others here in America. With his unofficially adopted daughter, Lou, by his side. I'm just happy to go lucky. Francis lives life with vigor, a smile, and purpose. He made a comment to me um, about a year ago, and he said, I can remember when I was young, I wanted to live as long as possible to help as many people as I could. On the cusp of hitting the one century mark, Francis has done just that. He recently set his sights on assisting Camp Corral, a free week of outdoor activities for kids of injured, ill, or fallen military service members. In the past five years, Francis helped raise $26,000 for Camp Corral, funding nearly 40 campers and even earning him an honorary cabin. Everybody waves everybody else. <laughs> Greeted by grateful campers, Francis visited a Georgia campsite for the first time, armed with stories and, of course, Hi, you all. a smile. <laughs> it was a rare moment uh, for these kids to celebrate him. I can't, I can't even put words into it. It was really a powerful moment. Lou says it is moments like this that pull Francis out of the hovering darkness from PTSD and remind him to always be a proud American. Thank you, Mr. Turner! In Winder, Georgia, Emily Iketa. Have a good time, everybody. Fox News.
can I hear you? As protests ramped up across the country condemning the zero tolerance border policy, a fight of a different kind was playing out inside a federal court. The government has not even been able to match all of the children with parents. That is extremely troubling. The court had set two deadlines for the federal government to meet. Children under five who'd been separated from their parents had to be reunited within 14 days, which is tomorrow. The injunction also stated all separated children must be back with their families by July 26th. Whether it's 3,000, 4,000, you know, at this point, I think we just want all the reunifications, but there's no question it's multiple thousands. Today, the federal government was in court asking for Tuesday's deadline to be extended. However, U.S. District Judge Dana Sabra said he was encouraged by the recent progress made by the government as it relates to the reunifications. All parties have been called back to court tomorrow to provide an update. Lawyers representing the feds say they're working to comply, adding 59 of the 102 children under five should be reunited in time to meet tomorrow's deadline. This has the House Energy and Commerce Chair, Republican Congressman Greg Walden, today led a bipartisan tour of a migrant holding facility in Brownsville, Texas. His committee oversees the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Our concern is to make sure that these uh, young kids get reunified with family members as soon as possible and that they're well taken care of while they're here. The parents and children will be reunited at ICE facilities, then released to await further developments in their court cases. It's the latest from Brownsville, Texas. Casey Stiegel, Fox News. A surprise visit to Afghanistan. The United States government revealed Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's trip to Kabul only shortly before he left due to security concerns. During his nearly seven-hour stop, the secretary met with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani, Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah, and pushed for peace talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Many of the Taliban um, now see uh, that they can't win on the ground militarily. We saw the Taliban uh, respond to the ceasefire that uh, President Ghani put in place. Pompeo's stop in Afghanistan is part of a week-long international trip that began in North Korea. Following two days of meetings in Pyongyang, he traveled to Tokyo to brief top Japanese and South Korean officials on his discussions with North Korea. Pompeo says North Korea understands U.S. expectations, dismantle its weapons, including production facilities, across a range of weapons and missiles. But North Korea's foreign ministry accused Pompeo's team of presenting gangster-like demands. Pompeo shrugged off the charges, saying the world stands behind the U.S. demands. We still have a long ways to go. Chairman Kim's statement following our discussions um, continued to express his desire uh, to complete the denuclearization. Critics claim the U.S. is softening its demands and moving away from its previously and often used phrase of complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization of North Korea. Pompeo says not so. Sanctions will remain in place until final fully verified denuclearization. President Trump pressed the issue Monday over Twitter, saying he's confident Kim Jong-un will honor their agreement to dismantle his weapons program, adding, quote, China, on the other hand, may be exerting negative pressure on a deal because of our posture on Chinese trade. Hope not. From here in Afghanistan, Secretary Pompeo's consultations with allies on North Korea and other security issues moves to Abu Dhabi and then Belgium. In Brussels, he'll meet up with President Trump at the NATO meetings to discuss its continued mission here. NATO Secretary General says the Security Alliance will do more to fight terrorism, including commitments in Afghanistan. In a series of network TV interviews, the president's attorney said he wants to see more evidence that justifies a sit-down between his client and special counsel Robert Mueller. We would not recommend an interview for the president unless they can satisfy us that there's some, uh, some a basis for this investigation. In a tweet, the president claimed, quote, public opinion is turned strongly against the rigged witch hunt. The two FBI lovers were a fraud against our nation and that the only collusion was with the Dems. That's a reference to former FBI lawyer Lisa Page and former FBI agent Peter Strzok, who sent anti-Trump texts and were removed from the Russia case. Giuliani said he believes Mueller is an honest broker, but questioned his team's neutrality. I think he's surrounded by biased people. 
uh, uh, almost, almost exclusively. Fox News confirms the president's legal team asked the Justice Department to investigate former FBI Director James Comey, whose termination by the president launched a special counsel probe. The June 2017 letters from the lead attorneys characterized Comey as, quote, Machiavellian, dishonest, and unbounded by law and regulation. In a separate development, top special counsel prosecutor Andrew Weissman is under scrutiny after newly disclosed FBI memos show he arranged a meeting with the Associated Press to discuss former campaign chairman Paul Manafort. The judge in Manafort's case is going to know why this guy is meeting with reporters and confirming any indication, any details of a pending criminal investigation. Multiple sources now confirmed to Fox News that former FBI lawyer Lisa Page is expected to appear before two House panels Wednesday for a closed-door deposition. The following day, FBI agent Strzok is scheduled to publicly testify about the Clinton email and Russia cases. In Washington, Catherine Herridge, Fox News. It's very much to the Botanical Gardens people's credit that they recognized that there was something cool here that could happen, and they really facilitated it and made it grow. I think it's absolutely magical. There, shouldn't, there should be more like this in the world everywhere. Some people think of uh, their hopes and dreams. Some, think, some people kind of close their eyes and think about what, you know, what, what kind of landscapes they can picture and then open their eyes to this, and it's just such a wonderful thing. It's just uh, for the normal people to walk by, just to sit down and have a chance to even just play it, a keyboard. Um, and getting that experience just for this, sometimes for just little kids, the first time they ever touch a keyboard, so it's, it's really kind of fun. It's so different from what I'm used to. I'm usually just playing at home. It's just nature everywhere around you, and it's like some places are more open, and then some are um, just surrounded by water and just a bunch of flowers. Like, it's just very, very different and peaceful. Yeah, it's you can never tell by looking at somebody what their relationship to music is until they actually sit down at the piano um, and actually start pressing those keys. You have no idea what's going to come out, and we're constantly surprised by it. It's beautiful. First, it was the warm-up. Crowds cheering on Travis Pastrana. I mean, Travis is an absolute legend. He's a beast. See, just come down and see some history. The Motorsports All-Star paying tribute to Evil Knievel, wearing a leather All-American suit and cape. And in the blink of an eye, one jump down. This one over 52 crushed cars more than 140 feet long. Heart's definitely racing a little bit for him. Yeah, my heart was rocking. Nobody had that idea. It was exciting. Then an even bigger leap of faith. Pastrana makes it look easy flying over 16 Greyhound buses, this time nearly 200 feet. We knew he was going to make it. Pastrana says this isn't about him or trying to set records. It's all to honor the legend, Evil Knievel. Evil uh, set the bar for everyone. You know what I mean? He had an open door policy. We've seen Nitro Circus a few times, and his stunts are, uh, you go home and you can't even believe what you've seen. You know what I mean? And you've actually witnessed it. I'm on my final week. After serving in the Marines, Sean Lynch decided to use his Montgomery GI Bill through the VA to pay for trucking school. He's almost ready to hit the road. I'll be testing early next week. Lynch enrolled at the Phoenix Truck Driving Institute for a four-week course. You have three parts here in the, they call the range. So you'll do your straight back test, which is going straight back and forth. That way you keep it straight. 
He knows the hours are long, the travel likely vast, but he also knows there are a lot of options. A lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity with various companies. They have a shortage just because people coming out of high school who really want to go out and put in the time effort be gone all the time. Trading director for the Institute, Roger Scholl, says the nationwide driver shortage is the worst he's seen in a long time. The American Trucking Association's numbers back up what Scholl says. According to the ATA, about 51,000 more drivers are needed to meet demand from companies such as Amazon and Walmart that are shipping goods across the country. The driving shortage is already leading to delayed deliveries and higher prices for goods Americans buy. For example, Amazon increased Prime membership fees recently, citing the rising price of transporting goods as one factor behind the decision. Recently, the company saw shipping costs increase 38 percent the first quarter compared with the same period last year. Scholl says trucking companies are doing what they can to attract more drivers. They brought driver wages up. They're increasing benefits, 401k, dental, medical, vision. Some companies are even doing profit sharing. They're offering incentives, uh, sign-on bonuses, three, dollars $4,000 some companies are doing. The goal here at the Phoenix Truck Driving Institute is to finish your course on Friday and be at work on Monday. Uh, I'll be going out and working for the oil fields. Lynch already has a job lined up in Houston. He's certain it will be a great fit, but he also knows he can pack up and ship out to the next gig anytime because there are so many out there. Anita Roman, Fox 10 News. I love you, you love me. He can't smell, he can't see, he can't pick up things, he cannot climb. What he can do is because of Dot Lee. Lee is a federally licensed rehabber who's taken care of Trooper since he arrived nearly dead nine years ago. I had to squeeze his mouth, eye dropper his fluid on his mouth, and then massage his throat so he would swallow. As dire as it was, the little guy just wasn't ready to check out. I looked at him and I said, oh my goodness, little buddy, you're a real trooper, aren't you? You don't want to die. That's when Dot Lee made the promise she has more than lived up to. And I promise you that I will stick with you for the rest of your life, and I will never let another person hurt you again. To call her devoted doesn't even begin to describe it. She feeds him. I let him know I'm here by touching. He'll open, and I stick the food in with my finger. <laughs> files his nails. She does exercises with him every day to keep his muscles strong. I had to uh, teach him how to move one leg at a time and now he has to pull himself up. If you notice he walked up and then he pulled. We do pull-ups together and the kids love this part. They laugh because there's this raccoon doing pull-ups. And most kids are enchanted by the little raccoon that can despite the odds. Dot and Trooper do lots of presentations for schools, nursing homes, civic groups. They come with a message of respect. And when we don't practice respect with each other, somebody always gets hurt. In this case, it's Trooper. He's now blind for the rest of his life because the man didn't give him any respect. But his story resonates with people everywhere. Diane Pelly travels from Ohio every spring to visit Trooper and Dot. I, I get like a two-year-old right before we come. I'm like, I can't sleep. I'm so excited to come because I just ad adore him. They're a familiar sight in her neighborhood. Dot and Trooper out for a walk. Trooper in his little carriage. Dot always ready to tell his story and why we should respect all living things. I am a very lucky person because I was the one chosen to live with him. And I feel every day that I am loved. Won't you say you love me too? Yeah. <laughs> Cynthia Smoot, Fox News. Meet Mr. Stubbs, one of the most unique residents of the Phoenix Herpetological Society. Mr. Stubbs came to the center back in 2008, his tail bitten off by another gator before coming to the center. Three years ago, he received a prosthetic tail to help him get around. He has a prosthetic tail because alligators use that tail to propel themselves through the water. And without it, we had to teach him how to doggy paddle. But much like humans, his weight fluctuates depending on the season. Alligators and crocodilians store their fat in their tails. And during the winter time, his stub was a little bit chubbier. 
and now it's a little bit thinner, so Midwestern University took the tail so they could do some readjustments on it. So Mr. Stubbs will be getting another new tail to fit him perfectly. This time they'll be using a 3D printer to make a cast so he'll be off and swimming again in no time. He knew extinct how to use the tail and he just wiggled his hips and he was able to come right up to the top of the water so it was pretty much from the get-go we didn't really have to train him how to do anything with it. Mr. Stubbs should be fitted with his new prosthetic tail by the end of the summer. Ty Brennan, Fox 10 News. The documentary Whitney follows the music icon's rise to fame through her tragic death at the age of 48. The movie features never-before-seen footage and those close to her telling the story. We want to concentrate on her legacy, which is music. Filmmaker Kevin McDonald conducted 70-plus interviews to find out who the artist really was. A lot of them were reluctant to tell the truth because I think so many people during Whitney's lifetime had trained themselves to kind of lie about what was going on. Even her publicist said to me, you know, for 25 years, I lied to the press every day about Whitney. The film addresses difficult topics, including drug abuse and even revealing Whitney was sexually abused as a child by a family member. It was kind of tough for it to be a reveal um, because it is so personal. You just have to realize that you're not responsible for other people's um, actions. It also covers many highlights of her career, like her national anthem. She changed the way the emphasis of the song was, was, was given and made it into a song about freedom rather than a song about oppression. So why share all this now? I think Whitney's reputation is so tarnished, you know, by what happened in the last 10, 15 years of her life. And in order to reinvigorate her reputation, it felt like people need to understand her. In New York, Ashley Dvorkin, Fox News. And I was going to say, if we had ended on that alligator story, guys, I was going to say, how many animal feature-y packages can we include in today's stream? I don't know. The raccoon one, pretty cute. It's kind of different. Just trying to canvas all the stuff, all the different topics. Um, and finishing out with some entertainment for you. But um, yeah, guys, a little quiet on our end right now. Our feeds aren't really popping so much. Like we mentioned, President Trump flying over to Brussels later on today. So that'll be in, in the next couple of hours. We'll have a shot of Air Force One uh, eventually landing over there. But for now, kind of quiet on our end. Our newsroom is kind of working on all of our individual stories for the day and getting ready for our shows tonight. But we're going to stay up on the stream, keep it running in case something does pop in, any breaking news or anything. We'll make sure we have that for you. And Sam will come over and um, host the next kind of portion of Fox 5 Live for you guys. So if you're on, thanks for hanging out. You can, you know you can follow us on our, um, there's our handle right there, Fox 5 DC on all platforms me right here and then Sam will be hosting the next portion. She'll come up in a second. Um, but definitely some really worthy, incredible stories, just like you're saying, to um, show you guys from over the weekend, just kind of catching up on what's been happening since I was out yesterday. But we'll be back uh, with more this week. And like I said, we're going to keep this running. So stay with us as we kind of look around for whatever else is uh, breaking for you to see, um, both here in the DMV, DC area and around the country and the world for you guys. So we're getting, gearing up, getting ready for All-Star Week. That happens next week one week from today, the game. So we'll be coming out with more information about that and what's gonna happen in DC surrounding that uh, for the next week. And then whatever else happens, the fallout from SCOTUS uh, and all of that on the Trump administration end. All right guys, more with you in a little bit. We'll be back.
questions. These would be sick people or people with a medical record. One out of four people in this country have pre-existing conditions. I'm looking out at all of you. One out of four of you, maybe more of you than that, have a pre-existing condition. So, you know, the fact that uh, this Texas lawsuit is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court, regardless of how the district court rules, the next Supreme Court nominee who gets confirmed is going to be making a decision. So Donald Trump has decided that he will not defend the Affordable Care Act. And in fact, in Nevada, he said, I basically um, gutted it. You know, that's the direction he's going. So a little over a year ago, as uh, some of you may know, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. And thankfully, I had insurance. So I could focus on my care as opposed to how I was going to afford the care that I needed. So I now join the millions of people in our country with pre-existing conditions, diabetes, asthma, cancer, of course. I would say that uh, if the Texas case prevails in the Supreme Court, people with a condition like mine, cancer, we either will not get coverage or the coverage will be so expensive we may as well not have that coverage. So the two organizations that, that uh, have vetted Judge Kavanaugh knows where he stands. And the fact that those of us who sit on the Judiciary Committee have to listen to all of these nominees who sit there who can't even tell us whether or not they uh, will abide by cases, settled cases, I'd say, such as Roe v. Wade, it's just a, they just hide behind this idea that they can come before us and say, oh, we're going to support precedent. That is total BS. Because when you're in the Supreme Court, you actually set precedent. That's exactly what they did last week when they undid a 40-year precedent that protected public sector unions and their ability to collect fees. So uh, the Supreme Court gets to set precedent. Don't tell us that you're going to follow precedent. So this next nominee, Judge Kavanaugh, is going to do exactly what the Heritage Foundation and the, the uh, Federalist Society expect him to do, and especially on health care. That's going to affect all of us. You can bet which side he's going to be on. Senator Booker, I'll be right back. I'm just going to vote and come right back. Uh, this is really, if you think about the fact pattern, this is really an absurd moment in American history that should be alarming uh, to us all. And this is not a partisan moment. This is really a moral moment for our country if we're going to allow this fact pattern to continue as it seems. And this is the fact pattern I'd like to walk through. First and foremost, uh, this nation was attacked by the Russians. Uh, this is something that was concluded by all of our intelligence communities, including a Senate bipartisan uh, committee, the Intelligence Committee, in a bipartisan fashion, confirmed not only that we were attacked, but also the gravity of this and the importance of us getting to the bottom of an investigation. In fact, the Attorney General, the second important fact pattern, saw that indeed we were attacked. He was involved with a campaign uh, that was under investigation, uh, and he recused himself and set up a special prosecutor. Uh, over these last months, the special prosecutors brought over 70 charges that affect over 20 individuals or organizations. Five people have guilt, pled, pled guilty, and there has been one person who has been criminally sentenced. That fact pattern is clear. That is not up for debate. And now we have a president who, with these some 20-something people surrounding him, his campaign and his presidency, uh, who now has an ongoing investigation. The President of the United States is a subject of a criminal investigation. Many elements of this investigation can now go before the Supreme Court. And the elements of this investigation are everything from can a president be criminally indicted? Can a president uh, 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 pardon himself? Uh, can a president end an investigation? And amidst all of these issues and more that can become from, from the Supreme Court, we have a president of the United States who is picking a judge who could sit in the balance of such a decision. Now, the judge he has picked, Judge Kavanaugh, the person he has selected was the only person amidst all of these individuals on his much-talked-about list, the only person that clearly has stated, hey, Mr. President, in effect, we'll give you immunity. I will be your shield. These are things that Judge Kavanaugh has written. 
He said a sitting president should never be criminally indicted. The president, I quote, should have absolute discretion about whether and when he can be independently investigated. And also decided who does the, he can also decide who does the investigating. Something else that Kavanaugh has written is that the president and the attorney general, rather than any court, should define and monitor the independent counsel's jurisdiction. And finally, Kavanaugh has written that any special prosecutor should be removable by the president. This is astonishing to me that you now have the president of the United States, and it's all the people in the United States of America, the thousands of judges he could have picked for, even the 20 plus people he could have picked for on his list, he chose the one person that has written that he should have immunity from any investigation and from, uh, uh, from any kind of prosecution that might result. This to me is astonishing, and not only that, it should not be allowed. The president of the United States should not be above the law. The President of the United States should not be beyond a criminal investigation. The President of the United States should not be able to pick the judge that will preside over questions involving his investigation. None of us as American citizens believe that any of us who are subject to a criminal investigation, that person should not be able to pick their judge. It's common sense. And so here we are right now, allowing a process to go forward that might have a president be able to decide what the outcome of this investigation will ultimately be. That should not happen. The Senate should not move forward with this confirmation, should not go forward with advising and consenting on this individual until this prosecution, this criminal investigation is done. And if we do go forward, then every Republican, every Democrat should join together with insisting that Kavanaugh recuse himself from any matter regarding this president that should come before the Supreme Court. This is not a partisan issue. We could walk back a few years in time and poll every 100 senators, give them this fact, this fact pattern, and everyone would agree that it is absurd in the United States of America that anyone who's the subject of a criminal investigation should be able to choose their judge who ultimately might have to decide what happens in regard to that case. Thank you. Senator Booker will go vote and then come back and join us. Absolutely not. When the president met with President Xi, when the president met with Kim Jong Un, uh, they took them to the cleaners, it seems, and got what they wanted. And we didn't get much of what we wanted. It's even worse for him to meet with a very, very clever, out for himself man like President Putin alone. And I am very much afraid what he would give away uh, without any advisors to keep him in check. Well, this morning, Senator Collins said that she noticed the Democrats had switched from a focus on Roe, one in healthcare, and attempted to better unify the caucus. I'm wondering if you could give your response to that, and how confident are you that you'll be able to unanimously vote? Well, the bottom line is we're focusing on both issues and many others. And uh, that's been pretty clear all morning. Um, as for uh, what will happen, I believe if we can convince the American people that Ju Judge Kavanaugh on the court would lead to the repeal of the Affordable Care Act and protections from pre with pre people with pre-existing conditions and repeal women's right to re reproductive rights, that we will get a majority in the Senate uh, to vote him down. Senator, <coughs> uh, this morning on the floor, you said that Democrats will have access and time to look at the Judge Kavanaugh's paper trail. Correct. Can you expand on what that would uh, Yes. And we want the same standard that we afforded the Republicans when they asked for a large amount of paper uh, trail from uh, Elena Kagan. There were 170,000 pages that were turned over by the archives. This is a vital appointment. It could affect America for a generation. And we want to see all of the documentation before we vote. So we are asking that the same expansive but necessary um, pr production of documents uh, that we afforded uh, the Republicans when Kagan was the nominee 
be done here with Kavanaugh as the nominee? Well, the sooner the better. We're not trying to delay. We just think it's important. Someone is trying to delay, but it's not me. Uh, um, we're not trying to delay. We just think that it's important to have these. The sooner the better. Senator Schumer, how, how far are you prepared to take this? Is there a point where you might Democrats might boycott the hearing altogether? Well, look, the procedural um, ways that are available to us in the minority are not that large. There is no way we can prevent uh, the Senate from meeting. There's been some discussion about that, but it just wouldn't happen. And if we did, they could unanimously consent all kinds of things we'd never want to see done without a Democrat on the floor to block it. And as for the committee, um, we believe that uh, we should be there and ask very tough questions of the nominee. If we didn't show up, Grassley in the past and other chairs in the past have just said, okay, we're going to vote without them there. And this is, by the way, in the end, this is about getting those Republicans to look at this, we know we have a number of them. When everyone thought uh, we were going to lose the Affordable Care Act and was going to be repealed, we made the case to the American people. And we got not one, not two, but three Republicans to vote with us. And so it is the same scenario. And it's not just about those two women. There's plenty of guys over there, too. Yeah, there are others who might be susceptible uh, to vote with us. And I would say this, the substance is the way to win this. The American people care about their substantive rights being taken away, whether they be civil rights, whether they be labor rights, whether they be health care rights, whether they be a woman's right uh, to choose. That's what we're focusing on. Last question. Again, uh, our focus is on the substance here. We think that the nominee would be so devastating in what he would put into place and turn the clock back decades um, that that is our main focus, not who comes with them and all of that. But we do feel, as Senator Klobuchar said, he has to answer questions. The old dodge of saying stare decisis has been thrown out the window because Justice Roberts, Justice Alito, and Justice Gorsuch claimed they'd follow precedent and the minute they got on the court, they did not. Thank you, everybody. And if you don't think Ruth Bader Ginsburg asked, answered questions about Roe v. Wade and about reproductive rights, watch the movie. <laughs>
Hey, everybody out there in YouTube land watching. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Uh, I know you guys were checking in with Molly earlier. Um, I just wanted to uh, check in as well myself and let you guys know what we're still working on and what is uh, going on today. Um, we just got um, word that um, President Trump has arrived in Belgium. He um, took off earlier today. I'm going to bring up the video um, of... Uh, he took off earlier today from uh, DC area going to uh, to Belgium there he's there to discuss um, some some discussions ahead of NATO uh, there's been a lot of pushback from the president he says in NATO the you know the, the agreement doesn't really work for the United States and uh, he's trying to do his best to uh, re rework them and say what you know try and negotiate what he thinks is, is better for us, um, but there's been a lot of controversy because of, you know, just the importance of, of NATO and what they do, so um, we will see, we will see what happens with that, but uh, we do have a shot, I see the runway, the plane, the helicopter hasn't a lot, uh, hasn't landed yet, but uh, we'll see what's going on with that, um, but that's one of the big stories we're working on today, and uh, this is a playback from Fox News. Let's check in with that. Trump traveling to Belgium Tuesday morning. It's the first stop on his four nation European tour, and he has some high profile meetings on his agenda. First up is the NATO summit in Brussels, where tensions are expected to be high between the U.S. and our allies over defense spending and tariffs. The president's already setting the tone ahead of the talks. NATO has not treated us fairly, but I think we'll work something out. We pay far too much, and they pay far too little. But we will work it out, and uh, all countries will be happy. But the European Council president is also going on the offensive Tuesday morning, saying the U.S. should be valuing the relationship it has with its NATO partners. Dear America, appreciate your allies. After all, you don't have that many. In addition to a stop in Belgium, the president's also heading to England, Scotland, and Finland, where he'll have a face-to-face -face meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. When pressed on the meeting, the president wasn't clear on whether he thinks Putin is a friend or foe. I really can't say right now, as far as I'm concerned, a competitor. It's a competitor. I think that getting along with Russia, getting along with China, getting along with others is a good thing, not a bad thing. The trip won't include all high-stakes meetings. In fact, the White House has confirmed for Fox News that while he is here in Europe, the president and first lady will meet with Queen Elizabeth at Windsor Castle. In Brussels, I'm Kevin Cork, Fox News. Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. Um, so that was a report, just to summarize what I just told you about the president going to uh, Belgium to talk about NATO, and um, we'll see what's going on with that. Um, but obviously, there's a lot of other hot topics, um, including the, the, the boys in Thailand that were... Uh, rescued today. Um, the last of the boys were taken out um, from from this cave. They were there for several weeks and I don't even know how they were getting these, these kids um, food. I know they were drinking some water from within the cave that the divers were going through, um, but they're being checked out for to see if, you know, if they're sick or if they have any infections. Um, you know, just to see if they're okay. And um, I heard, you know, there was some reporting earlier that uh, the kids had to wear sunglasses because they've been in the dark for so long. Their eyes, you know, your eyes get adjusted to the darkness for a long time. You know, it's like when you go to the movies and then you come out when it's still sunny out and you can't really see that well. So, um, th but definitely on a more extreme side. So um, I hope they're all okay. And uh, we'll see what's coming for once the, you know, once the, they assess you know how they're doing and you know try to figure out how they got there and, and you know just hear from their their side of things so I'm really curious to hear about that um, and uh, so yeah um, let's see what else we have for you I have a couple of reports that uh, from Fox here 
Let's do something fun. Oh, at least we'll start out with the cave rescue. How about that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Il est là. Yeah, bye. Team is fired up by us. But these days, that's not a sure thing. Hackers have now found a way to read the electronic signature fobs emit, and they are stealing cars. How easy is it for the hacker to pick it up? It's actually incredibly easy. You know, I use a RFID blocker for my uh, credit cards, but you know, the average person is not going to walk around with a tinfoil wrapped car key, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually fairly easy to take that signal, amplify it, and unlock your vehicle remotely. Diana just had her key go out the other day, only to watch a locksmith duplicate another fob in front of her with frightening ease. She believes the hack is true. I'm afraid it's true because the guy came on in like 10 minutes, 10 minutes or less, he could give me another key. And Yvonne's heard of this hack, so she's been keeping her fob key hidden in her purse, thinking it protects her. It does not. They said that it's actually blocked and you have to put it in aluminum foil. You, I didn't know that. In fact, experts say the best you can do is to keep your fob in a coffee tin at night and during the day, wrap it up in aluminum foil. A low-tech, low-budget solution Eddie, for one, is not ready to embrace. Now that we told you about this, is there anything you would do differently? Just keep, keep the keys in your pocket, that's it. But that won't stop the signal. It has to be in aluminum foil. We well, cannot keep the, the yeah, keys know, always. Right? Cyber experts, including the guys at Hyper, say the days of the fob are numbered. There's actually no fix for this. That over the next couple of years, they'll be phased out in favor right now of something that would go on your smartphone, but it's not like that's not being hacked either. In Herald Square, Arthur Chien, Fox 5 News. For more than two weeks, they were trapped in a flooded cave. More than. All right, so we have some footage. The plane landed um, in Belgium. We're going to go take a look at that.
So that was um, a shot of the president landing in Belgium. Um, for those of you just joining us, uh, he went off to Belgium earlier today, just got there uh, to go to the summit to discuss NATO. Um, but just to recap, I uh, have, have some of the details. Um, so the president's been very critical of NATO, and uh, this is kind of amid like the, the conversation you know, the conversation between the president and, and uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, but the, so the U.S. intelligence community com concluded that uh, Russia, so the Russia, this is, ooh, sorry. <laughs> so we arrived in, there's a controversy over Russia and then how is this impacting the, the relationship with NATO is uh, that he told reporters that, uh, let me see here. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Um, sorry. He has been talking to NATO countries to fulfill their goal of spending 2% of their gross domestic products on defense by 2024. And uh, this is according to AP. During the presidential campaign, the president suggested that he might only come to the defense of the NATO um, nations if they fulfilled their obligation. So there's been kind of like a tit-for-tat kind of... Uh, conversation going on here with the president and all the other NATO nations, of course, of one of which is uh, Russia. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation on that and uh, how this will impact, you know, our future and, and just our interactions with other countries from the, from, you know, from, from here on out. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. Um, but uh, we're also working on, as I said, the Thai, the Thailand, um, evacuation, the, getting those boys out of the, the cave, and um, we're also working on, um, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else? The, the other big point of interest would be, of course, the president's um, latest announcement of the pick for the Supreme Court to replace uh, Justice Kennedy, and um, there is some, you know, anticipation of uh, pushback from, from the House and the Senate, um, especially as midterms are approaching and whether or not the this candidate um, will be able to pass you know there's been a lot of contention on whether or not you know a new justice and more conservative justice would overturn Roe versus Wade and um, the impact on the nation from that so let me play out this is I got a little snap it a snippet this was from earlier today, well no, I believe last night, um, the appointee uh, Kavanaugh and uh, Vice President Pence and Mitch McConnell. So uh, we will see what goes on with that. There's been. A Okay, so we just, there was a little bit from, sorry, the announcement uh, of the new uh, justice nominee for uh, Supreme Court. So, uh, the only other thing I wanted to play out for you, let me see, is anybody on here today? Hi, Joseph Fuego, thanks for watching. Uh, <laughs> yes, you were here today on July 10th, uh, thanks for watching, and um, and I have a, another, this is a really cute story. Um, this is about a, a veteran who uh, he was in World War II and now he is helping other vets. So let's see. Oh boy. There we go. For 96 years, go. Francis Turner has overcome every obstacle before him. 
sustaining a severe head and knee injury in World War II, facing near homelessness, and raising three children with Down syndrome, all who have since passed away. I'm the last of my clients, so to speak. Yep. And now you're helping dozens of other kids. Yes, because I believe it's the thing to do, and we should help others here in America. With his unofficially adopted daughter Lou by his side. I'm just happy to go lucky. Francis lives life with vigor, a smile, and purpose. He made a comment to me um, about a year ago when he said, I can remember when I was young, I wanted to live as long as possible to help as many people as I could. On the cusp of hitting the one century mark, Francis has done just that. He recently set his sights on assisting Camp Corral, a free week of outdoor activities for kids of injured, ill, or fallen military service members. In the past five years, Francis helped raise $26,000 for Camp Corral, funding nearly 40 campers and even earning him an honorary cabin. Everybody raises everybody else. <laughs> Greeted by grateful campers, Francis visited a Georgia campsite for the first time, armed with stories and, of course, Hi, you all. a smile. <laughs> it was a rare moment uh, for these kids to celebrate him. I can't, I can't even put words into it. It was really a powerful moment. Lou says it is moments like this that pull Francis out of the hovering darkness from PTSD and remind him to always be a proud American. Thank you, Mr. Turner! In Winder, Georgia, Emily Ikeda. Have a good time, everybody. Fox News. First, it was the warm-up. Crowds cheering on Travis Pastrana. I mean, Travis is an absolute legend. He's a beast. See, just come down and see some history. The motorsports all-star paying tribute to Evil Knievel, wearing a leather all-American suit and cape. And in the blink of an eye, one jumped down. This one over 52 crushed cars more than 140 feet long. Heart's definitely racing a little bit for him. Yeah, my heart was rocking. Nobody has that idea. It was exciting. Then an even bigger leap of faith. Pastrana makes it look easy flying over 16 Greyhound buses, this time nearly 200 feet. We knew he was going to make it. Pastrana says this isn't about him or trying to set records. It's all to honor the legend, Evil Knievel. Evil uh, set the bar for everyone. You know what I mean? He had an open door policy. We've seen Nitro Circus a few times, and his sons are, uh, you go home and you can't even believe what you've seen. You know what I mean? And you've actually witnessed it. I'm on my final week. After serving in the Marines, Sean Lynch decided to use his Montgomery GI Bill through the VA to pay for trucking school. He's almost ready to hit the road. I'll be testing early next week. Lynch enrolled at the Phoenix Truck Driving Institute for a four-week course. You have three parts here in the, they call the range. So you'll do your straight back test, which is going straight back and forth. That way you keep it straight. He knows the hours are long, the travel likely vast, but he also knows there are a lot of options. A lot of jobs and a lot of opportunity with various companies. We have a shortage just because people coming out of high school who really want to go out and put in the time effort be gone all the time. Trading director for the Institute, Roger Scholl, says the nationwide driver shortage is the worst he's seen in a long time. The American Trucking Association's numbers back up what Scholl says. According to the ATA, about 51,000 more drivers are needed to meet demand from companies such as Amazon and Walmart that are shipping goods across the country. The driving shortage is already leading to delayed deliveries and higher prices for goods Americans buy. For example, Amazon increased Prime membership fees recently, citing the rising price of transporting goods is one factor behind the decision. Recently, the company saw shipping costs increase 38% the first quarter compared with the same period last year. 
Scholl says trucking companies are doing what they can to attract more drivers. They brought driver wages up. They're increasing benefits, 401k, dental, medical, vision. Some companies are even doing profit sharing. They're offering incentives, uh, sign-on bonuses, three, four thousand dollars some companies are doing. The goal here at the Phoenix Truck Driving Institute is to finish your course on Friday and be at work on Monday. Uh, I'll be going out and working for the oil fields. Lynch already has a job lined up in Houston. He's certain it will be a great fit, but he also knows he can pack up and ship out to the next gig anytime because there are so many out there. Anita Roman, Fox 10 News. Meet Mr. Stubbs, one of the most unique residents of the Phoenix Herpetological Society. Mr. Stubbs came to the center back in 2008, his tail bitten off by another gator before coming to the center. Three years ago, he received a prosthetic tail to help him get around. He has a prosthetic tail because alligators use that tail to propel themselves through the water. And without it, we had to teach him how to doggy paddle. But much like humans, his weight fluctuates depending on the season. Alligators and crocodilians store their fat in their tails. And during the winter time, his stub was a little bit chubbier. And now it's a little bit thinner. So Midwestern University took the tail so they could do some readjustments on it. So Mr. Stubbs will be getting another new tail to fit him perfectly. This time, they'll be using a 3D printer to make a cast, so he'll be off and swimming again in no time. He knew instinctively how to use the tail, and he just wiggled his hips, and he was able to come right up to the top of the water. So it was pretty much from the get-go. We didn't really have to train him how to do anything with it. Mr. Stubbs should be fitted with his new prosthetic tail by the end of the summer. Ty Brennan, Fox 10 News.